Alaska Insight is supported in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers just like you. Thank you. Less rain and warmer weather has caused problems in southeast Alaska as communities face an unusual circumstance in a rainforest, drought. We're discussing community health and water conservation tonight on Alaska Insight. When you think of extremely dry conditions, California wildfires probably come to mind, but in 2018, some parts of southeast Alaska were officially declared to be in drought. The region has gotten enough precipitation in the last few years to flood some parts of the country, but it's not nearly enough to sustain a way of life dependent on rain. Reporter Elizabeth Jenkins brings us this story from Metlakatla, where a community is trying to adapt. Drought looks different in a temperate rainforest. You can be surrounded by water and in desperate need of it at the same time. Metlakala relies on precipitation to power the lights and provide drinking water. But the community is navigating a different relationship with a resource that seemed abundant. Metlakala is the anglicized pronunciation of a Simpsian word, which means saltwater channel where the wind dies down. Gavin Hudson, who serves on Metlakatla's tribal council, says there's a common saying. The precipitation that feeds Metlakatla's lakes is some of the best tasting drinking water in the world. In fact, a water bottling company briefly opened up here. Hudson says the idea of having an abundance of water is an important part of the culture. The Simpsian have always been people of the water, people of the salmon. Hudson says locals have been noting dry conditions and the changes it's brought for a while. Low salmon returns in streams typically cooled by rain. The blueberry bushes haven't been as plump or abundant. And a big difference, grown-ups haven't been able to fall back on a familiar summer joke they would say with a wink. The usual thing that you would hear is, Mom, hey, Mom Dad, can I go swimming down on the beach? And their response would be, is there still snow on the mountain? The catch, he says, there used to almost always be snow on top of the mountain, all the way through July. Now we don't say that because there's no, even if we do get some snow, it's not deep. Um, it's not snowpack, it's just the light dusting, and it's usually gone after a good rain. Um, that's unusual. Snowmelt helps feed Melikatla's lakes depending on the season. It's like money in the bank, but recently there's been more climate variability, less snow and rain. In an average year, Melikatla receives around 110 inches of precipitation, that's down significantly to 80 or 90 inches a year in the last five years. Melikala is on the Annette Island Reserve, just a short ferry ride from Ketchikan. It's home to about 1,500 people. It's traditionally a community powered by hydroelectricity. But with water in short supply, the community has had to run on diesel, which can make it expensive to turn on the lights. A few years ago, Janelle Winter noticed a dramatic shift in the water supply after hiking up a mountain to scope out the main reservoirs. When you could see all three of those dams and you could literally walk across that channel on the old 27 dam, you're like, this is not a normal condition and you probably should never be able to do that. Winter's work previously focused on invasive species, but around 2015, her job title changed. She became Melikatla's Climate and Energy Grant Coordinator. She says at first, she struggled with how to describe the unusually dry conditions. It just felt wrong that you could be in a temperate rainforest and be in a drought. Winter says she knew the community needed to scale back its energy use to build its reservoirs back up. To do that, Melikatla would have to navigate a different relationship with water. For a time, that's meant burning diesel for the traditionally hydro community. Mellie Catler received funding from the Bureau of Indian Affairs for a one-time purchase of bulk fuel, which can be as high as $4 per gallon. 
Winter says cutting back on hydropower has helped restore water levels in the lakes. And a phone call from the National Weather Service last year finally gave her a way to put the experience into words. They told her, yes, you are officially in a severe drought, and so are other communities in southeast Alaska. Really helped us to define and, and take even more ownership of what was going on, that this was something that, that we needed to learn how to deal with now so that when we met the challenge again in the future, we would already know how to do it. But the Malakatla Indian community has already taken steps to prepare. We're going to talk about the drought declaration for Southeast Alaska, and then ways that you guys can help save water and energy and important to your parents' money. Winter has been in front of this classroom before. These kids have been primed on the drought since they were in elementary school, even when no one was calling it that. Today, they're getting the drill again. She tells them there are ways they can take charge and cut back on water consumption. They can change the narrative, even when the climate seems unpredictable. It's the future they're inheriting. Trying to teach grown people to change behaviors is really, really hard. But getting kids excited about changing behaviors is much easier. And if you can get them passionate about it, then they take that message home. Winter says these kids have really taken the conservation message to heart. Melakatla has cut its water use in half since 2016. But the community isn't out of the woods yet. One of its newest diesel generators broke last year, resulting in an emergency declaration. If another extremely dry spell comes along, the town could be powered by a generator that's over 30 years old. As for today, though, the community is back on hydro. Winter points to a landmark waterfall cascading down the mountain. It's likely spillover from one of the main reservoirs. During the worst parts of the drought, this waterfall was dry. The flow should be a happy sight, but Winter says it's more complicated than that. We used to look at the waterfall and just be so happy to see the waterfall. Oh, the waterfall's lovely and awesome. And now we look at it and we're like, man, that's all stored energy. Metlakatla is in the process of figuring out how it can raise the levels of the reservoir to hold more precipitation on the good days. This system, constructed with the understanding there would always be enough water, was built for a different time. Gavin Hudson says some in the community are uneasy about a future with less rain. Most of our people who just want to provide for their families and raise their children and have a good life and work hard in their jobs, I think those folks um, have just another thing to worry about. Higher light bills, oceans that are changing, forests that are changing. In Metlakatla, I'm Elizabeth Jenkins. Joining me this evening is Elizabeth Jenkins. Elizabeth is a reporter for Alaska's Energy Desk based at KTOO in Juneau. Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks Hi, for Laurie. being here. Thanks. Also in the studio is Brian Brettschneider. Brian is a climate researcher with the International Arctic Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Hi, Brian. Hi, Laurie. But you're based in Anchorage. Correct. Right. Elizabeth, thanks for your reporting in Metlakatla. Really a powerful story there. And beyond the people that you spoke to for the story, how are residents preparing, or are they? Are they worried about the continuation, I'm sure they are, of, of these drought, dry conditions? Um, but the power plant operator you spoke to for one of your pieces um, said that he was praying, hoping it doesn't happen again. The tribal council member, Gavin Hudson, said that people just, you know, it's another thing to worry about. How, how are they thinking about this more broadly? Yeah, the supervisor at Melakala Power and Light, he's someone who is concerned. He's worked at the power plant for over 30 years, and he's seen changing conditions. Something that I didn't mention in the video is back in the 1980s, there was a sawmill in Melakala. Businesses like that could tap into the microgrid, they'd pay a premium. So when you did have these really, really dry conditions, that sort of helped the community stay afloat and be able to afford diesel. But with this really, really dry condition that they had for the past few years, that hasn't necessarily been available. So they've had to rely on other resources, such as the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, giving them the one-time purchase of bulk fuel to be able to stay afloat and get their reservoirs back up. 
So the sawmill and the fish processing plant that used to be in Metlakatla sort of helped subsidize the entire community when they right. were buying power. And now you don't have those businesses there. So this is a conversation that they're having to navigate. How do we keep the lights on when we're in this extreme drought? Well, and it's also kind of converging at, uh, at a bad time because there's a lot of, of debate about the power cost equalization program and right. how that should go forward in the future. They aren't currently, uh, they don't currently qualify for that because of their access to hydropower, but have they considered trying to make the case for that? At this point, no, but you're right. Um, Melicala doesn't have power cost equalization. Places like Ketchikan, which have also been burning diesel, don't qualify currently for power cost equalization. These are traditionally hydro communities. Mm -hmm. So if we do see drier conditions, this could be a conversation we start to see emerge in the future, but we're not there quite yet. Mm -hmm. Brian, Governor Wally Hickel once proposed building a freshwater pipeline to California because of the abundance here, you know, calling Alaska the Saudi Arabia of water. Fast forward, and you've spent much of this year researching drought in Alaska, a topic that hasn't had much research in the past. So what have you learned, and why hasn't there been more uh, examination of this? Well, what I've learned is that there's very little uh, data on drought in Alaska. You know, if you look at the lower 48, there's lots of information, there's research centers, there's uh, federal programs, there's, uh, it's in the news a lot. Uh, but here in Alaska, there's really been almost no research done. And the, the little bit of research that has been done uh, is, is mostly tied to invasive pests like spruce bark beetle. Um, but very little or to nothing on uh, the impacts to hydrology, to uh, hydroelectric, um, to even to fires. Uh, so it's really kind of a new emerging area of research that uh, we're just trying to, right now even, kind of define what the parameters are. I mean, literally the first building block is, well, what is a drought in Alaska? Does a drought in southeast, is that the same as a drought in the interior or on the north slope? Um, and, and the definitions really are, are mostly unsatisfying. Uh, the, every definition from the National uh, Drought Center to the National Weather Service uh, basically says it's a lack of precipitation that has adverse impacts. And so, um, so kind of even just setting up some definitions is really important to, to, uh, to developing a future policy of, of how, we, how we deal with these uh, conditions in the future. It sounds like uh, if, if, the, if the definition is that vague at this point, mm -hmm. it sounds like a lot of anecdotal information from communities is going to be crucial, adverse impacts. So mm -hmm. how much are you relying on what people are saying about how it's affected their lives and their livelihoods for gathering up this information to create that definition for Alaska. Yeah, well, and that's a really good question because, you know, we, we have to, we can't just necessarily look back and say, well, what years, you know, was there less precipitation? What years was there more? So for example, here in Anchorage this year, you know, we'll probably end up the year with, a, with an unremarkable precipitation total, probably a little bit below normal. But that masks the fact that for three months, when we were supposed to have our rainy season, it just didn't rain at all. And we had a very intense, perhaps even record-breaking drought. Uh, again, in, in a time where it, historically, when we look back, this year will, will look rather unremarkable in a lot of ways. So, so we need those kind of proxy records and we need those, uh, those kind of testimonials from people like, hey, this, this, these were impacts and these were severe impacts that we felt at the time so that we can now build our baseline for, for, uh, for describing these things. Do you rely a lot on citizen observers who have uh, calibrated uh, instruments that are, you know, checked out by the National Weather Service or by your office, or is it a combination of folks like that that are sort of official um, citizen record keepers and mm -hmm. also just, as you said, how it feels for mm -hmm. citizens to experience these things? It really is at the community level. It's what were the impacts and, and how were people affected by a lack of precipitation, uh, much more so than, than kind of formal records. And so, you know, maybe it's a water supply in, in one community, uh, and maybe it's, um, you know, winter snowpack in another, and maybe it's reservoir storage in another, and maybe it's, um, you know, uh, fuel moisture for fire conditions late in the season. So those are things that you really can't tell and, and you can't document without someone there to, to, to catalog these things. Uh, or, or to provide an oral history. Um, so, so really the saying, you know, if a drought happens and there's no one there 
to observe it, did it really happen? And, and in many cases, we, it, it's just lost to history without someone there to, to identify how it was impactful to their community. Fascinating. Uh, Elizabeth, what did Metlakatla residents tell you about their cultural relationship to water and how that sort of intersects with water conservation? Sure, you probably heard Gavin Hudson say in the video, Simshian water and salmon are very, very important. And also, like in the video, there was a water bottling plant there at one point. So, I mean, it's always just been this massive part of the culture. You look around everywhere in Melikala, you see water. And so I think this has been really hard for people to wrap their head around, we are in a drought. Um, for a long time, Janelle Winter just called it extremely dry condition. She went out and talked to the community about it, but she didn't have a way to describe it. So that drought designation in 2018 really meant a lot to them because they gave, it gave them a language to talk about what they've been experiencing since like 2015. She mentioned that it's really hard to change adult behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so she's working with kids in school, but clearly adults did respond because they cut their water ha use in half in just a very short time period since 2016. That is really dramatic. Did, did people talk about how they accomplished that and, and how the community kind of came together to make those decisions? They had uh, a climate change conference there, which they invited the community to attend. And then children are the best messengers. Sometimes it's worked a little too well. She talked about kids unplugging uh, DVR recorders and <laughs> things like that to save energy, but it's really gotten the message across. So just like simple fixes, like um, when you're doing your dishes, maybe turning off your water earlier, unplugging certain things you have around your home, just kind of drilling it into the culture there and then using the kids as these little messengers. I think I've even heard them called water cops to go out, <laughs> tap your That's parent great. on the shoulder and say, hey, you know, we're in a drought or we're having these extremely dry conditions. Maybe we should be more mindful of the energy consumption. I like that term, water cops. That's <laughs> great. Brian, have there been drought conditions all across uh, Alaska regions this year or are there concentrated areas um, to a select few places in the state? Yeah, so it's important to think of drought in terms of time scales, right? So, um, you know, say March and April is a time where we don't get much precipitation. So if it doesn't rain or snow those two months, we won't consider that a drought. It's not really a big deal. But then if it doesn't rain in July and August, for example, then that is very impactful because that's a time where our, our environment expects a lot of water. So in July, there was pretty much no precipitation anywhere in the state. And so the, uh, the drought monitor started to, to paint in even the interior up to the, uh, the Arctic Circle even uh, in drought conditions. And then their rain kind of came at the end of July and that line was, was pulled back. But, but then without any rain in uh, all, pretty much all through August, uh, the, the drought conditions here in South Central um, uh, were elevated quickly to, uh, to substantial or even uh, exceptional. Down in Southeast, then that, now we're talking particularly in Southern Southeast about a two, three, four year, even five year conditions. If you look at five year blocks of time, very, very dry. Uh, and so, um, you know, the, the National Drought uh, Information System Center, they, they have this big push now for, for defining drought in thing, a thing called a flash drought, where maybe a drought can kind of pop up over a couple of months. It really doesn't happen in Southeast. You know, droughts have to evolve over long periods of time. Um, but it's been, um, been slowly building up down there and finally, it takes a lot for it to go away. Some, we heard this here in Anchorage, oh, we got a bunch of rain, so let's, 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 uh, let's call the drought off. Well, it takes, it takes more than just a, a wet period because the entire ecosystem uh, needs to be fully replenished, the, the entire uh, soil horizon all the way down to the groundwater table. So it takes a lot for, for it to get back to normal, and, and finally we're starting to see that. So the the forecast, the prediction for the future is mm -hmm. warmer, wetter for mm -hmm. Alaska. And your numbers uh, show a 20 to 25% increase in precipitation. So I imagine that would be easy for people to say, whew, okay, no worry about drought anymore. Mm -hmm. But that's not really the case, is it? So how, how will this change things? And warmer, wetter doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be drought in the future. Exactly. So it, while we are expecting maybe a 20% increase in precipitation, uh, a lot of that will be in the summer in, for, in the form of more thunderstorms. Those, those events tend to run off more into the, into the streams. Um, but more importantly, um, we're expecting a lot of 
uh, additional, say, vegetation growth, well, those, the, the vegetation transpires a lot of moisture back into the atmosphere. So it might not necessarily make the soil um, you know, m carry more uh, water content. But we also expect there to be, because of the warmer temperatures, when it doesn't rain, for it to be drier. We expect the soil, the sun, to evaporate more moisture. And so this is something we see in the lower 48. Up here, we generally have a net moisture sur surplus over the course of a year. So there's more precipitation than evaporation. Well, now we're going to flip the switch. And we're going to have more evaporation. Even, we're going to have even more evaporation than precipitation, e even including this increase in precipitation. So, so when it's dry, it's going to be drier. When it's going to be wet, it's going to be wetter. So really big swings. Really big like. swings. Really big swings. And so, yeah, so here in Anchorage, we average, say, 17 inches of precipitation a year. We may end up getting 20 or 21, but we may end up getting more droughts at the same time. Mm. Elizabeth, the, the water cops in Metlakatla, <laughs> you visited classrooms there. Did you talk to students about how they're seeing their future? Are they, is it kind of stressful for them to consider this unknown that's, that's in front of them? Or are they just uh, taking these practical steps like unplugging things and um, just mm -hmm. taking action? So I got to go out with some young kids who are part of the Boys and Girls Club. They're part of a GLOBE NASA's program, so they are citizen scientists. They are going out, they are doing the monitoring, they are reporting it back. And these are kids who have commercial fishermen as parents. Salmon's on the dinner plate pretty regularly. And so they know something's happening. Mm. Salmon returns in streams have been sort of unpredictable there lately. And so some of the things these kids are testing for are water temperature, also something called dissolved oxygen, which can be impacted by warmer water conditions. And so they know something's going on. They know that this affects their parents' livelihood and, and potentially their future that they're inheriting. Mm -hmm. and, and did they, uh, how long has this project been going on with NASA and what are they really, are they just monitoring all that they can or are they looking at some specific goals with the information they're collecting? So the GLOBE NASA program exists in many countries around the world and in many places around Alaska. So they usually get students, in this case they're getting an after school program with the Boys and Girls Club. And so what they're doing is they're going to a stream that's had pretty typical salmon returns and ones that, that's had irregular to no salmon returns and they're comparing those two streams together. And they're just wanting to get a snapshot of this time. They've been doing it since around 2018, I think, mm -hmm. and they're gonna continue to do it um, for probably the next year, if not more. All right. Brian, earlier this week on Talk of Alaska, you mentioned that we sort of flipped a switch in 2013. Mm -hmm. What did you mean by that? If you look at the, uh, the climate data, particularly the temperature data, uh, right around Memorial Day in 2013, uh, it just it got a lot warmer uh, all across Alaska. And we've been kind of stuck in this, this new warmer paradigm now for, for over six years, six and a half years, even while some other indicators have hinted that we should be on the, uh, you know, in, the in the overall ebbing and flowing, we, we, we should have maybe even flowed downward a little bit. Uh, we've been going up, which uh, looks, pretends really poorly for when those other indicators uh, are going to tilt our climate system toward warm. So um, it's been, it's been really alarming how, uh, how much warmer we've been uh, the last you know, six and a half years, much more so than, say, the global average over that same time period, or even the Arctic-wide average. We've been really kind of a, a bullseye for, uh, for warming temperatures. And, and what are the, the models that you're looking at for the next 50 years? What, what are we expecting? Well, there's a number of different scenarios out there, depending on certain uh, uh, you know, carbon emission uh, patterns and, and, and emission rates, uh, but generally we should expect, you know, two to four to five degrees Fahrenheit increase in temperatures over the next 50 years. I mean, there's really, there's a lot of warmth that's already baked into the system. So even if we went to carbon neutral, carbon zero right now, okay, there's a couple of degrees warmer we're going to get no matter what. And so beyond that, everything else is what uh, is, a, is a policy uh, response, is a response to policy for, uh, for carbon emissions. All right, uh, Elizabeth, in about 30 seconds or so, what's next for your reporting on the Energy Desk with these issues that Southeast communities are facing? Some of these communities are having to consider a different climate reality. Melikatla is considering raising the level of the reservoir. The message right now is places are not out of the woods yet. They're having to figure out how are we going to adapt to these big swings. So that's something we're keeping an eye on. Mm -hmm. 
All right, well, thank you so much to my guest, Brian Brett Schneider, with the um, Arctic Research Center in based in at the University of Alaska Fairbanks mm -hmm. and Elizabeth Jenkins from KTOO in Juneau. Thanks for making the trip up to Anchorage to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. The climate predictions for Alaska's future indicate the state will be increasingly warmer and wetter. But less snowpack and more rain will change how rivers and lakes recharge during spring and summer dry spells. Historically, it was glaciers that maintained a steady supply of water to keep flow rates up and water temperatures down, something important for salmon and other fish, as well as providing affordable energy through hydropower for southeast residents. Warmer temperatures during low rainfall periods, coupled with a potential for more insect attacks on trees and vegetation, can quickly increase fire danger. Alaska's rapidly changing climate is bringing new challenges, and planning now for conservation, mitigation, and adaptation will help residents prepare for a different way of life in the future. That's it for this edition of Alaska Insight. You can find past episodes of the show, as well as special web extras at our website, alaskapublic.org slash alaskainsight. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Lori Townsend, good night.